Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Trader Babes. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us on Twitter at Trader Babes. Today's episode is such a meaningful episode for us. Our guest today is one of the most notable and accomplished traders we have ever seen. He has had a profound impact on both of our trading careers. Um, and I don't think another YouTube channel or trading podcast has ever been given the opportunity to have this unprecedented access to ask this incredibly accomplished longtime trader these inside questions. Absolutely. I, this is going to be very special and probably one of the most exciting things we'll do down the line. Um, he took me under his wing and uh, introduced, me, introduced me to this whole new world of trading. And um, he's one of the best in trading psychology. Um, there's no one like him out there. Absolutely. I'll yeah. I mean, he's been trading for more than 20 years. So he's seen every market imaginable. And there is just some things that you can only learn through experience. And that kind of experience can't be bought. It can't be taught. Um, he's known by so many traders as the legend. And I can tell you that so many of the biggest names in trading right now, the ones with the biggest following on Twitter, they learned from our guest. Do you want to do the honors? and introduce the legend by name. So yes. <laughs> we can all say hi. The legend trader Guy Gentil, our very much beloved Gigi, our king and savior at Day Trader Pro, always willing to help and encourage and everybody to change their life for the better. And um, he's one of the most humble people you'll ever meet. I met him in Puerto Rico. You could not come across someone any more kind and humble. And he's well known everywhere. There's, oh, yeah. I don't think any chat rooms anywhere that doesn't know Guy Gentil. Absolutely. So or at least the legend of Mr. Gentil. Let's bring him in. Hello, can you hear us? Yes, how are you guys? Good, how are you? Thank you so much for coming on today. We are thrilled to have you here. Thank you, it's my pleasure. We both wanted to share just a kind of a brief story of how we each met you. I know Aria came across you uh, quite a long time ago, so I will let her go first. Yeah. Um... I met Guy uh, when he was um, in one of his controversial trades and I started follow him, following him. Uh, he has a lot of haters and actually in the beginning I was one of those haters. And then I, after a couple of weeks, I didn't too much, you know, to realize like he's very humble, nice guy and um, became a, a Guy Gentile fan, just like all his haters do. They all end up, um, you know, saying what he really is and um, become the, his real followers. So he he's well known and followed by a lot of people for, you know, the epic penny stock trades he makes and um, option value stocks. Uh, he does it all. And um, Guy, you're completely one of the most interesting people and unique people I probably will ever know um you're you know um <clears throat> you're known for your penny, penny stock trades and crypto trades and some controversial trades and um we just can't wait to hear more from you yeah and i came across guy in a similar fashion a little bit i was in another discord group and i kept hearing these traders mentioning him but not really saying who he was so I wasn't really sure so I went on Twitter um, and followed him and it was only after I mean I probably made a fool of myself because I think that um, his Twitter sent out like an automated message and I responded to it and I was like yeah my trading's good how's your trading when did you start trading no idea 
you know, who he was. I only Googled after. And then that picture of the, of the model driving the car into the pool came up. And I was like, I was like, oh my gosh, this, what an opportunity from someone to learn from. And then I asked like, you know, people who ran these discords and they were like, he's, he's an absolute legend. He taught me, like, you have got to, um, learn from him as much as you possibly can because there's no one better mm -hmm. i agree 100 percent. yeah <laughs> um, I, uh, I i do appreciate appreciate that uh sorry if i cut you off I'll, I'll no, no, you're fine. no 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 you're fine um, i was gonna go ahead and ask your opinion <laughs> yeah so i mean listen a lot of my big trades are not um penny stocks you know they're you know nasdaq stocks you know penny stocks is usually considered otc markets or stocks under five dollars um, which I mostly stay away from, you know, it's mostly, uh, stocks that are above $5. Like, you know, my biggest trade was, was LCI, although I did start buying it around 450 and I, I don't know where it is right now, but it, it went up to like 15 bucks and that's where I got a lot of haters. It was a big short seller in that stock. And I really did a lot of homework on this thing. You know, I knew that there would be a short squeeze in this thing eventually, not the epic type squeezes that we see in today's market because we just didn't have the amount of retail traders this pandemic has caused so many people to come into the market probably like 10 times more people if not more than 10 times more right um so you just get massive short squeezes because everyone jumps in the same stock had had i been long the number of shares i had in lynette um during this this era that we're in it probably would have went to 150 dollars. it got to 15 which was a decent short squeeze um so i mean that, that's one of you know the epic trades i've done a couple other big epic trades as well but most of my trades you know they're the ones that i've made a lot of money in okay is mostly the long side and it's mostly you know from a lot of research you know, researching who the share, current shareholders are, what type of shareholders are they? Um, the company itself, you know, is the company going to do a debt offering? Is it not going to do a debt offering? That's what I've teached, you know, um, I've kind of retired from my teaching at this point. Like I have my videos online for free at this point. Uh, I'm not trying to, you know, profit off education anymore. It's basically, uh, I did it for about three or four years. I probably had a thousand students over that time. And I think I offered both of you uh, free access to my courses and my chat room. Am I right? Am I right? Yeah, you did. Right. So, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that I've always liked is to see women entering into this male dominated market, which is why I did what I did. I was like, I want more successful women in this business because it's just, it's just too much testosterone in this business, you know, which is, you know, why. I, you know, you say I'm a legend, it's because of the fights that I've had, you know, with other men, basically, you know, in this business and everyone stroking their own uh, ego. So, uh, you know, so. Yeah, and you're so bold and expressive. You don't give a F, you know? So that's why people you know, love I, you. It's 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 because of the way I grew up. You know, I didn't grow up with a silver spoon. I had a fight for everything that I have, mm -hmm. right? So. That's the reason why I'm still that way now. Like I, I will just keep fighting and fighting until the tables turn on my opponent. Even if, you know, there's been situations where, you know, things aren't looking so great for me, but I just don't give up, you know, in a trade, in a trade, it's a different story. In a trade, you have to give up if it's not going your way. You mm -hmm. can't change that, you know, but in a fight you can, because, you know, you, basically it's a chess game. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you master Absolutely. chess, you will eventually destroy your opponent, which is what I love to do. That um, actually brings me to the next thing I wanted to talk about. I hear you talk about how you come from um, this great middle-class family and you share this with people usually and you wanna encourage them to build their own life, to make um, their trading passions come true, which I admire so much about. Um, and um, you have one of the most unique, interesting lives. Um, you worked as an undercover for the FBI, and because of your experiences in recognizing those schemes, um, uh, to 
you know, ex-girlfriends driving your bands into a pool. You're just, you know, perfect to be in a uh, five-star uh, Hollywood movie, okay. which is like I, a big I, short, I but absolutely to... much more. And I want you to make that. I've been telling this to you forever because it's a shame if it doesn't get made. Listen, and- I, I agree with you. It's It's been an interesting ride, you know, but at this point in my life, you know, I'm going to be turning 45 in a couple of months. And... You know, I'm I'm kind of enjoying the you know not so uh, crazy lifestyle, right? So I, I've definitely calm calm down a bit. You know, hopefully no more cars in the pool. You know, no more uh, Twitter fights. Just it's just. Oh. I don't was, know how you can handle all that, honestly. Like it, it, it was fun, but even if somebody's twenty, like it would drain them out. Like, oh my god! I, I, have, I, have, a, I have a lot of patience. I'll tell you this. This one one blessing that I have is I have this incredible ability to remain calm under massive stress. And I'll tell you that I've, I've been under stress that probably most men would have jumped, you know, off a building, basically, off the stress that I've had to deal with in, in my lifetime. And to me, it just doesn't even bother me. When I worked with the FBI and they've seen me in these stressful situations, they would tell me like, you have ice in your, in your you don't have blood, you have ice in your veins. <laughs> Like, Maybe that's that, why that's, you're, you're ever in danger. It makes you so reason? successful here, though, because you have to remain calm because trading can be stressful. It probably adds to your success a lot, right? Yeah, it does because with trading, you have to be patient and you have to remain calm, right? Mm-hmm. Stre- stress and, and emotion is what destroys anyone's trading career. Mm-hmm. Because if you can't, you cannot think clearly when you're under stress. It's just an impossible. It's an impossible thing to do. Try just imagine like yourself in a a stressful situation. And a stressful situation would be like a breakup with someone you're in love with, or a death in the family. Any of those things causes high degree of emotion and stress, and you cannot think clearly under those situations. So it's like you have to, and and it's hard. Like it's easy for me to say that. Listen, you you should try and remain calm. And some people is just in, not in their DNA to remain calm. They just cannot do it. But you can practice just like with anything in life. Practice makes you good, right? Practice in trading makes you a better trader. Practice managing stress can help you manage stress better. And there's, there's techniques that you can do, hmm. you know, that you could read well, books I, about how to do it. Just I, mean, like listen, general... I'll, I'll, I, will, I will tell you just like some basic stuff that I would do when I was under like maximum stress levels, I would put on music that would change my mood, right? Music is very powerful tool, right? So depending on what kind of music you're listening to, you can actually change your mood. You can force yourself to think about something else, right? That's why like when, you know, something tragic happens in someone's life, sometimes people will just They'll bury themselves in work so they don't have to think about it. Mm-hmm. They ignore the issue, right? That, yeah. you know, that's not always a good thing to ignore a problem, but mm-hmm. I have. I, I've ignored it as if it doesn't exist, but, you know, still in the back of my mind, mm-hmm. you know, and I would dedicate, allocate, sorry, a specific time frame for my mind to think about those things and how I'm going to handle it. And then I would turn it off and it's not the finger. And that's it. I'm thinking about something else. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. This is good to know. Right? You can change things like that. You start with changing it in real life, practicing like right. so in real life, t- turning another, another, into super power. Right. Exactly. So another thing I'd use to, um, I would focus my energy, you know, on whatever. If I had a mission, for example, and I need to get something done, this is whether starting a business, working on a cover with the FBI or making money on a trade. Nothing else in the world existed to me other than the, the, whatever I had to tackle in front of me. I would just block everything else out. So it'd be like tunnel vision focused on whatever I need to get done and it's getting done. That's why I've, I've been able to start, you know, three or four brokerage firms, you know, over my career, you know, worked with the FBI successfully, like mm-hmm. did, I don't know, dozens and dozens of undercover operations like they didn't oh they wanted God. to work with me forever make that movie 
I want to hear all about it. <laughs> well, talking about your beginning, because I know that your life has changed so much now. When you first started trading, like how, what was that beginning? Like, did you, did you go to school for finance? Did you start with a small account? Like if you could just tell us, bring us all the way back to your very beginning. All right. So this, this is where I was in my life. I was 19 years old, approximately could have been 18, but around, around 19 years old, I was living in New York and I was working at Coca-Cola. Um, and I had a pretty good job at Coca-Cola. You know, I really, I liked working there. It was fun. I was learning a lot. And I had some money saved up from working there. Probably, I would say probably about $20,000 I had saved up at this time. And I was banking with Bank, Bank of New York at the time. Because it was like in the town that I grew up on. It was like the neighborhood branch. Everyone used them. But guess what? They were still using at this time. Um you know, like a check book, not like the one you write checks from, but the kind like you go into the branch and they would stamp your balance on there. You've probably never seen that in your lifetime, right? But that's, that's how archaic this bank was. They, were, they weren't using computers yet. They're basically just handwriting your balance. And uh, the girl that I was dating at the time who ended up, you know, becoming my first wife, um, she was like, let's go to Citibank. Citibank has everything online. I was like, okay, fine. So we walked into Citibank. I opened my account. While I was opening my account, I asked the uh, woman, I was like, well, is there any way I can make more than just whatever one or 2% interest? She was like, sure. Let me introduce you to our investment team. So we walk over to the next room and I talk to them. I open an account with them and I put, I think I put half of the money in at that time, maybe 10,000. So I put I put like 5,000 into a mutual fund that he recommended and the other 5,000 into Coca-Cola because I worked for the company and I like the company. And I believe that if you work for a company, you should be vested in it because you'll work harder. That's so great. that's what I did. So when I go home, you know, it's like, cool, I'm, I'm invested. I didn't know what it really was yet at the time. I'm 19 years old, didn't go to school for any of this stuff. And um, that's to answer your question. I did not go to school for finance. Um, so through the months that went by, I would notice my account fluctuating in value. Coca-Cola was going between $50, $54, and my account would be going up and down, you know, 500, 600, then back down again. I'm like, so I thought to myself, you know what? Next time it goes to 54, 55, I'm just going to sell it. And then I'll buy it back when it goes back to 50. I didn't know that I was actually day trading. I didn't, I didn't realize what I was doing. It's just, mm -hmm. I just came to this conclusion that I can do that. So I discovered day trading on my own. No one ever told me there was no, and I never wrote a book about it. And that's basically how I started. That was my very first trade was in Coca-Cola and a mutual fund. And then I started trading in and out of it. And then all of a sudden I'm starting to watch CNBC and I'm getting hooked and I'm seeing <laughs> stocks go from a dollar to eight dollars. I'm like, wow, if I would have put all my money at a dollar, I went to eight, I would have 200,000, blah, blah. All these things are crossing my mind. Mm -hmm. And so basically I start buying these stocks and I actually did end up picking a stock that was around a dollar and it did go to eight, but unfortunately I sold it the day before at a dollar 25 and the next day it opened at eight. Oh and I was no. Like, Holy crap. Like my broker even didn't reflect that I sold it yet. So my account showed like, 200,000 oh. or whatever it was, 100,000 in there. And I was just like, so mad, so mad. I was like, how could I do that? I literally sold it like two minutes before the market closed. There was no after hours trading then. And the very next day, some news hit and the stock's $8. Ooh. But I bet that's, so, that was something that got you hooked, you know, <laughs> knowing like what kind of returns you would get, even though you missed out Yeah, on that. so that, exactly. So that got me hooked. So now I do my next big trade on you know, like I did some research, but still I was no pro. I didn't understand what I was doing still, but I bought Yahoo at $37. Okay. But this is the mistake I made. I put my entire $20,000 into it and I went two to one leverage. So I've actually bought $40,000 of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened, but Yahoo crashed down to 18. I got margined out. My account was at zero. <gasps> So here I am, 19 years old, a month or two into my trading career, and I lost my entire life savings. It was so freaking devastating. 
so devastating. Like I, I did not know what to do with myself. That's part of the, the first lessons of learning how to deal with stress and emotion, because I'm telling you, I was a, a wreck. But, you know, I thought, you know, I told myself, listen, you're 19 years old and you had $20,000. How many 19 years old had $20,000? You lost it. Fine. But you can make that back. You have a good job, whatever. Right. You get it back. And it was a mistake. The mistake was in this particular case using leverage because had I still was, if I was able to still hold Yahoo for just like eight months more, that same 40,000 would have been like a million bucks because Yahoo went absolutely nuts right after that. It went to like 600, $800 or some crazy shit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, you know, so I realized, okay, I was right in my analysis, Mm -hmm. but the market is rigged, right? So they're going to shake people out. They're going to shake people out so that they can buy the dip, get your shares cheap, and then they rip the stock afterwards. We've seen that. How many times have you seen that happen? Where a stock that you think is great, they rip it down, make everyone think, holy shit, the sky's falling. The emotion gets the best of them. They sell from either fear or they sell because they're margined out. And then the stock rips and goes nuts, right? So that was my first lesson of that. But this is what I did. I took a break from trading for about six months and I started researching and researching because I realized I didn't know what I was doing. And there was no online courses like there is these days back mm-hmm. then. It just, the internet was relatively new. This we're talking about 96, 97. Was, internet's pretty new at this time. It's a few years old. It's still, it was still dial up internet, you know? Mm-hmm. It was not like, a, there's no DSL or cable modems or anything like that back then. Now we have so, fiber, fiber networks. Exactly. <laughs> Everyone's got fiber now, right? So, mm-hmm. so anyway, I started reading books about options and, and I read a book. I, I wish I remembered the names of these books. The only one I can remember that I read was Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. And I was very motivational. I think any new trader should read that book. It, it really gets you addicted to trading even more. <laughs> but um, <laughs> We'll put I, a link read, to, to the Amazon for it, um, for that book. Yeah, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. I, I think I still have my copy of it somewhere mm-hmm. from back in those days. So besides, so I read about options and I read another book that talked about recognizing patterns in the market. I don't remember the name of it, so I apologize for that. I, I hate having to tell you something and not be able to give you a resource to it, but I'll just tell you what it was really about. Mm-hmm. And and I held that in, you know to to how I trade even up till now. And re- in order to be a successful trader, you have to be adaptive to the market. The market environment is constantly changing. It's done on purpose because if it stayed the same, everyone would get rich eventually. So they figure mm-hmm. out the pattern, they all do it. So it's constantly changing. So your job as a trader is not to just find one way to trade and stick to it. It's to see what the pattern is that is working and not get stuck in the way it used to be because that's how it used to be. It's not how it's going to be now. And I've seen traders blow up over and over and over again because they're used to a specific market pattern. And then all of a sudden it stops. They had massive success. I know a guy who started with five grand turned it into four million and then lost all of his money and borrowed money and lost all of that. Right. So you have by to not adapting. adapting. You have to be adaptive in in the sense that you have to recognize the patterns of the market. Meaning that like, if there's a bunch of short squeeze happening all the time, you don't wanna be a short seller because you're gonna get caught and you're Mm -hmm. gonna get completely destroyed, right? It's, Mm -hmm. you can be a short seller in different type of market patterns when, you know, there isn't that much retail in the market. When there's smarter money in the stock market, then it's time to short because smart money will not buy into a pump and dump essentially. Right. Mm-hmm. If there's not enough retail to do it, then the stocks, the stocks won't have those moves. Right. But in these type of markets now, look at what happened to GameStop. That could not have happened to GameStop just two years ago. There wasn't enough retail in the market to have caused that move. Mm-hmm. And right. what so, are you seeing, like our current market conditions right now? What, what is the pattern that you see happening? Well, I mean, my philosophy overall in the market is that the market is designed 
to continuously go higher forever. The same way that the government has to keep printing money in order to continue financing its expenses, right? So the market is subject to that as well. And what I mean by that is, think about it like this. You have all these employees all over the United States. A portion of their money every week goes to where? Their pension. Where did that money go? Goes to the market. So every week there's more money being thrown into the market, no matter what. There's more, as long as people are working, there's more money being thrown into the market. Now you have these, you know, these irrational moves where the market moves up a lot, and then you have these 10 to 15% corrections. That's normal, right? You could have you could have one of those every six months, basically, or every at least every year, and a crash once every 10 years. And a mm-hmm. crash is what we saw in 2008. We saw it again in 2020, it was, or 2019, 2020, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Again, that's like an every 10 year occurrence, you could expect a crash. So we're not due for a crash. We just had one. We just also had a massive run in the market from from the lows in the market to where we are now. If you actually look at my handle on Twitter, it, it was SPY420. And that's pretty much exactly where we went to before we had a big pullback, right? Exactly. Um, How did you know it was going to get there? I think 420 has a lot of significance, you know, Mm -hmm. Elon Musk's 420, 420 is the cannabis thing. It's just, I don't know, it just just seemed like the government's going to just keep printing money. We're getting a 420, right? And eventually we're going to get over 420, but you know, event, we might have a pullback. We might going to have a resting period for a little while. We might pull back to as low as three fifties. I think at three fifty, it's a buy, right? Mm-hmm. The companies are, are going to be a buy at three fifty on the spy because the, the reality is because we've added so much money supply into the world, you know, in the United States of the U S dollar, the market has to go up. It has to hold these levels and they're, they're they cannot stop printing. They cannot. Right. They, they can't let off. us they, go they to zero. Off, <laughs> if they turn off the, the funnel, right? Mm-hmm. Or whatever you want to call it. That's it. Everything, everything's going to stop. We're going to have, you know, uh, just something much worse than the pandemic because you're going to have a depression if they turn that off. Mm-hmm. So they have to just keep printing. You know, I would say that probably what are we at 27 trillion in debt right now we'll probably reach 100 trillion in in less in 10 years probably wow that's which is just which is just if you think about how massive that is right because we're at 27 it was it was basically 17 just like four years ago it just went up by 10 trillion dollars right so you know, they can't, if, if they can't hold interest rates lower because nobody wants to hold U.S. dollars, then they have to raise interest rates, which causes the government to have to print even more money supply to pay the debt. So it's just like a problem that cannot go away. I do have a solution to the problem, but obviously I'm not a politician. And, mm-hmm. you know, they, they probably would never do something like this because I, I, there's just, the country's just so disconnected between Republicans and Democrats. And I know we're not talking about politics, but it's just part of the market as well. You it know? affects it completely. Absolutely. Yeah. So just, just imagine if, if somehow the government said, hey, we're going to dilute the dollar another 50% overnight and we're going to print our way out of debt so that we have no debt. Everyone's dollar is worth 50, half of what it was, but now the country has no debt. And that's really the only way it's going to get out of debt, either default on it and not pay anyone, which that would be worse, right? Or just, we've, other countries have done it, right? They basically have diluted their, their, their dollar to pay debt. And I, mm-hmm. I would just say dilute it, pay off all the debt because we need a reset. If you notice, they keep talking about the great reset right? Mm -hmm. What's it going to be? Maybe a complete collapse of the US dollar and an emergence of a new dollar, 
a new maybe cryptocurrency dollar or crypto dollar? A lot of people would like that. I mean, we are seeing a lot of rallying <laughs> it's, around the crypto, it's, around cryptocurrency. It's, it's going to eventually happen. I mean, it's just, it's inevitable that the U.S. dollar is eventually going to fail. Mm-hmm. Well, they're happened. trying to come up with their own crypto, right? Not necessarily Bitcoin, where it could benefit us little guys, you know? Right? Yeah, but it has to be a system where a government can't be in control of it and potentially work because it, it's the same problem. Mm-hmm. How, how does the government, how are they going to finance, mm-hmm. you know, this massive debt that we have? Taxes can't pay it. There's only probably $4 trillion a year. Uh, I don't even know if it's that much. No, the government, I think, is, was spending $4 trillion a year and maybe only collecting you know, $3 trillion, for example. I, I, I haven't looked at the numbers in a while, but we're definitely, the government's definitely spending more than it collects in taxes, right? Which keeps adding to the, to the national debt. But then also we just printed all this money on top of that. We just borrowed more money. Yeah, and uh, we also had problems um, with uh, having to pay out social securities um, before the coronavirus hit. So this is uh, this is all has to happen. Something big has to happen. Well, it's like you said. I mean, the the market is so rigged, and there are so many different ways of doing it. Um, I know. Something that you have experience in, which I would love to hear more of too, is being a market maker. And I feel like so many traders, they hear that word, they don't know what it means, and it scares them. So could you tell us a little bit about your time as a market maker? And can you tell us some of the things that you guys do to gain the upper hand on retail? So, I mean, what market makers have let's just say for example you're a market maker working at citadel Mm -hmm. i mean a lot of it is electronic now not the way it used to be in the old days where you'd see an actual an individual trader is looking at an order book so a lot of it's electronic so most of it is pretty simple they're just basically pairing orders and in some cases taking the other side of the trade so for example you want to buy 100 shares of of citibank you know if they have a, a customer that is selling they just they just match it your trade's printed, it's done, you know, but, you know, if they don't have the other side of that trade, they might um, take the other side of the trade, betting that you're going to be wrong and cover against your order later on, or just cover in the market when it goes their way. Um, the advantages that they have is that, especially the big firms that have tons of orders coming in from multiple firms, they have an idea what stocks are being bought by retail and in general as a whole and what stocks are being sold, right? Mm -hmm. So they can hedge their bets essentially, right? They're not supposed to be front running your order, but But they are. listen, there's another way they can do it. For example, if they see a ton of retail orders coming in to buy GameStop, well, they don't have to front run you by buying stock. They could just buy a shitload of options, calls, knowing that it's going higher because there's so much demand for the stock. Mm-hmm. And right. So, so what it gives them is something that the brokers, you, they call it color. They can see the color on the stock because they know what you don't know. When you see trading, you just see the trades that actually happened. You're not actually seeing the, you know, um, the order and their true size of these orders. Mm-hmm. Like they're not supposed to front run and, they won't because they'll get they'll get in trouble if they do, but they can do other things like buy call options. And when and, you mentioned hedging, actually, I think a lot of people don't know what hedging is, especially newer traders. And it's one of the most powerful, um, you know, ways to trade to save yourself from going bankrupt. And you're the one who introduced me to it, and you do it all the time, especially if you're entering with yeah. a big size. Um, can you give us a like quick? Sure. Yeah. When, when a stock has options, not all stocks have options, right? So when it does have options, you can hedge in many different ways using options. The simplest form of it is this. If you go long shares, let's just say you go long 10,000 shares of the stock, 
um, you can buy a hundred puts on the stock at a lower price. You know, you pay a premium for that, but you're you're hedging your bet against complete complete loss, right? I like to to kind of do like a hybrid. For example, if I go along a stock that's eight, it's eight dollars, for example, and I don't think that it's going to go below six. Right, but I'm worried that it might drop to 750. Maybe I don't have that good of a price. What I'll do, it's not a true hedge, but it reduces my, my cost basis on the stock is I'll sell puts instead of buying puts. I'll sell the $6 or $5 puts, maybe collect a quarter for them, right? And now I just reduced my price. In addition to that, if it's like, you know, if I think I'm gonna hold this stock for a month, and I see the weekly options at $9, for example, are going for a quarter as well. And I don't think I'm going to, you know, it's going to get there by, let's just say the Friday and I bought it, you know, Tuesday, I'll sell the $9 calls for a quarter as well. Again, reducing my cost average. Exactly. Right. So now I just, so now I just took the stock that I bought at eight and I brought my price down to 750. Right, so it's it's not a true hedge, but I'm reducing my cost basis, even if the stock did not move. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. And, uh, if and we could there's, just there's... rewind a little bit, though, because I want to, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll go more on Complex. the hedging, and then I wanted you to tell us a little bit more about the the pump and dump schemes too. So go, yeah, go ahead and finish what you were saying, though. Uh, for yeah, so, for like a more simpler type of hedging, because you know, that's great. It's um, a little bit more delicate with what people can do right now, knowing just about calls and puts. Uh, what would you do if um, you wanted to hedge? The, sim the, simplest, the simplest form of hedging, if you're long, is to buy puts, okay? Because when you buy a put, it's basically protection on a stock that drops, right? Because it makes money as the stock drops. But it costs money, so you're actually increasing your cost basis. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have to you have to use. Number one, your trade needs to be researched. You need to know what is the potential range and you really shouldn't buy, you know, stocks that are too risky to the point where there's a real potential of it really like going out of business or dropping 50 percent. Right. So let's just say that that's not on the table. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but you still want to hedge your bet. The stock's eight bucks. Um, you buy a seven dollar put. You pay 50 cents for it. Okay, well, how do you cover that 50 cent cost? Because now you just increased your cost basis to 850. Here's one way you can do it. You bought the $7 puts, right? That gives you protection if it drops below seven. But if you really believe that it can't drop below five, right? You can sell, you know, some of the $5 puts, collect some of that premium back, right? And then re-protect again by buying the $3 puts again, you know, just for catastrophic loss. For like five cents, mm -hmm. so you you get some. So you basically instead of your cost basis being eight dollars and fifty cents because your hedge, maybe it's only eight and a quarter now, and then you want to pay for that for that quarter as well. And the way you pay for that quarter is you can sell a call, that's that's higher. Mm -hmm. You're so you, I I always enjoy watching you do this. Yeah, you you have to you have to be protection costs money. So you have to figure out a way to reduce that cost. And I use options to hedge, but I also use options to lower my cost basis of my hedge. And, so, and theoretically, I mean, if you were just going to keep, um, you know, your long-term investments, that's another way to uh, increase your, your profit and the money that you're making off of them, right? Is to sell, is to continue. Well, I'll tell you, sell I'll tell you like when, when I was long Lynette, to reduce, I, it was a one year hold. So what I was doing is I was selling calls and selling puts because selling puts, you could run the risk of owning more stock if it drops below the strike price, right? right? But it was also, I loved the stock, so I didn't mind. So if I was collecting 70 cents, it's like, hey, I'm collecting 70 cents. So that means that it's got to drop by whatever point, let's just say it had to drop a dollar, but then my cost basis is $1.70 lower than where it's trading now. Right. So that's how I kept I kept lowering my cost basis by continuously selling puts and continuously selling calls. But I would not sell calls during earnings seasons because that's when it could really have the pop. 
-hmm. Yeah, I remember right. you were holding Lynette for about a year. A year. You made about millions of dollars. I didn't know you were actively doing that with the options. That's interesting. I, I probably made it. I probably made you know half a million to a million dollars just selling premium on that. That's awesome. It's an incredible right? opportunity to you know for people to try and and learn how to do that because a lot of times they're left like holding something long term and it's just tying up capital. So that's that's a really good thing. And right. I wish so more you, people I knew. turned it. I turned it into an income stream. Basically, it's like, mm -hmm. it's like, all right, I'll, I'll make $150,000 a month in premium while I'm holding my lock. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so um, it's like, it's like owning a building and collecting rent, basically, you know? Right. Yeah. I wish, I wish more people knew about this because I feel like something that so many new traders come in here and do is they sit and concentrate on like the penny land runners, especially last year with what we saw in 2020. It was, it was absolutely insane. The, the things that would run and everyone thought, you know, it was always going to be like that. And then we get caught up in the people who maybe run like these different groups and they front load the stocks and then just offload them on everyone. Also known as the pump and dump and something that I have been saying to Aria for a really long time is that I so wanted to talk about this with someone who is an expert because I want more people to be aware of it and know how to spot it. So would you enlighten us about that, please? Well, I mean, when you use the word pump and dump, that has a legal meaning to it, okay. right? So mm -hmm. I'm not an attorney, but I'll tell you what I believe it means from my experience okay mm -hmm. uh, you know it basically pump and dump means to cause a stock to go up artificially right by using false and misleading information right and to lure unsuspecting investors into it and then to dump it on them and then the mm -hmm. stock price crashes that's like the legal i believe the legal definition of it right. so Every, everything else, like it's similar to a pump and dump is what I can say. Like, so someone run, runs a chat room. I don't agree with it. I don't, I think it should not be allowed. Yeah, it's someone's what running a chat room right now. with yeah. hundreds of thousands of traders in it. And they go out and buy a hundred thousand shares of stock and then tell everyone about it. And they buy into it and they dump into them. I, I don't know if it's illegal or not. Because again, if, as long as they did not use false and misleading information, it's probably not illegal, but it's not ethical. Right. Right. And that's so there's a difference be between legal of. and ethical. Those are two different things, right? Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, you have to be wary of that. But listen, at the end of the day, I'll give you an example. Lynette, right? I did my research on it. I bought it. I told everyone I bought it. I filed that I bought it. Mm -hmm. So guess what? probably a lot of people bought it after they saw that I bought it and they saw my research, but that's clearly not a pump and dump. Mm -hmm. That's a long-term position. Now I'm not obligated to tell anyone when I sell, when I sell, I file. Of course. That's it. Right. So, you know, that's a bit different than every week, you know, <laughs> um, telling everyone buy this stock, you know, mm -hmm. and I never, I never did that in any of my, education. Like I never told anyone buy this stock. It's basically, this is what I'm buying. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm buying it. This is the hedge I'm putting on. And if it works, people see it works. And if it failed, unfortunately people saw it fail too. Right. Of and course. Always complete transparency in the room. I think some people would say otherwise on Twitter, but they didn't know, like we always had complete transparency in the room. Yeah, I've taken plenty of losses live. Yeah. So, well, you know, but I've also when, had I've also had massive successful gains too, but you know, big, yeah. big trades, but it doesn't always work. Of course. Um, Nothing's so 100%, right? No. I mean, usually when it doesn't work, it was my fault in my process or I was rushing my process or I just simply did not follow my process. Mm -hmm. Right? That happens because, you know, when you have 20 trades that go right in a row, you know, you start playing fast and loose and then you get smoked. 
Mm -hmm. right? So you got to remain disciplined to your process. And it's very hard to do because your, your mind will psych you out to make you think that you're, you know, whatever you touch doesn't matter. It's just going to turn to gold. Right. And the reality is that that's not true. Eventually it might work one time, two times where you didn't do the research and then all of a sudden you didn't do it and you get fucking smoked. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially then you're, you're back to to gambling, which is kind of like, you know, exactly. when they so, blindly follow these calls, that's what's happening. Yeah, you should. No one should be blindly following these calls. Like mm-hmm. they should not. Like we had a process when I was running my room. Right, my process was: what are the gappers in the morning? Okay, these are the gappers. What is the float? Okay, this is the float. How many shares are short? Okay, this is how many shares are short. You know, who are the insiders? Okay, these are known insiders. You know, is there a registered shelf? Okay, there's a registered shelf or there isn't, right? So we had a process that we followed. And if you, you, you guys were there, so you'd hear this process that we'd follow. Mm-hmm. And, you know, once we found one that we thought was the right, and we, you know, you'd hear us disagreeing with the other moderators, right? So, which is mm-hmm. good because you get to debate and learn from that. Mm-hmm. And then we put, it, we put our trades on. And sometimes we stopped out. And sometimes we, we would, you know, just scalp it, scalp it, scalp it. You know, sometimes like these algorithms, I would just be able to read them so well that I would just, I would annihilate these pumping algorithms because I understood exactly how they basically were working. And then you notice that they would just turn off for like two weeks because they mm-hmm. have to recode it because someone's figured it out. That's incredible. How can you spot that like on a chart, like the, 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 the algorithm pumping or front loading? It's not just, it's How not just, look for it's it? not just the chart. It's not just chart. It's the way the stock is actually trading in level two okay. and then in the size that's being showed and how it's executed and just um, the price, the price action. The price the action is what allows me right? to see. Not the front loading? Yeah, it's the algos. Okay. Like okay. the algorithms, like I haven't been looking for them for weeks, but you know, there's a lot of these penny stocks you call them, they're NASDAQ stocks, but they're stocks that are anywhere from one to three or four dollars. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden they had news and it's got 20 or 30 million shares pre-market and it trades 200 million shares. Those are algorithms. Those are a bit harder. They're a bit harder, the ones that do that much volume to dissect, you know, but the ones that can do, that are doing 20 or 30 million, I watch them long enough. I will figure out exactly what pattern they're using because there are algorithms. Mm -hmm. Those algorithms, what they're, what they're trying to do is two things. One, trap shorts and take all their money. And two, trap longs and take all their money. Right. So how do they do that? So what I would notice that these algorithms would do, right? Number one, they want to get everyone's attention. So how do they get their attention? It's got to show up on the leaderboard, the leaderboard, meaning the most volume top percentage mover. Okay. So once you have a stock pre-market that is up 70%, right? It's got five, 6 million shares. What that tells a short or a long is that the stock's in play, check. There's liquidity, check. But both of those things might be false check right. boxes because the liquidity could be created by one person and the mm-hmm. price move could be created by one person or, or group or algo, right? So it's a false sense of security that, hey, if it goes against you, you can just get out because there's liquidity. Mm-hmm. So what happens is these algos, they know how much stock they're putting on their books the more stock that they put on their books means that the more people they trap short okay so they have to keep the short in the stock and keep the longs in the stock so as it's like moving up they'll move it up a little bit okay let it come in a little bit so people that want to buy the dip buy the dip get those Mm -hmm. longs in there right but you know, not let it come down too much to where the shorts are taking profit. They'll sit there and buy it up at those lows, their algo. Mm-hmm. As it pops, right? It's gonna pop because some shorts are gonna start covering when you see it go back up, right? They might sell a little bit, right? 
They're letting retails also chasing it. So it will have these, these kind of moves to where like it drops, but doesn't ever get low enough to, for the short to get out at a profit. So they'll just keep the shorts, which just keep averaging in, averaging in, averaging in until guess what? It's, you know, two thirty. they got an hour and a half to get out of their position and they're short 800,000 shares. And they know that if they start buying, the stock's going to go from $8 to 20 bucks. Mm-hmm. And that's how they got them. The longs, especially in this market, they just never want to sell because the stock's going to the moon. It's the next game stop, right? Stocks <laughs> only go up. <laughs> Remember? Right. So, yeah. so basically, as long as it doesn't drop too much to where the stock chart looks broken, the longs will stay in and keep buying the dip. Right. right? So, but what will happen is let's just say it's you know 315. And the shorts are all hidden out. The algo will wait and they'll let the shorts hit out. Once enough shorts hit out, whatever shares they have left, boom, they just fucking dump them right off, right there. <laughs> and they're out. That's incredible. They yeah. They don't care what happens after that. Sometimes, these, though, the stock, because they've attracted so much retail, that the stock holds up and continues going higher. Mm-hmm. Right? Because there's yeah. more shorts that come in too. Like that's, well, you see some of that happening too. I've seen it happen before where, you, where, where the, the algo, you can tell the algo's out, but the stock's not crashing that much yeah. like it, because people buy the dip. Right now, there's, there's all these stimulus checks that have been handed out. There's just so much money that's gone to Robin Hood and every, everyone's just looking to get rich. Like I, I was actually um, with a friend of a friend the other day, this weekend, and he was like, Hey, should I buy Dogecoin? It's at 63 cents. Elon's going to be on TV tonight. Mm. I said, are you crazy? What do you know about it? That you're telling me, <laughs> you know, what research? No research. Just again, looking for someone else to tell you what to do. Mm-hmm. Right? right. And it was so who they're asking or not, you know, just if it was someone else, this guy would have put $2,000 into Dogecoin. And where is it now? 30 something cents. You lost half his money. Wow, I told him, I was like, incredible. listen, don't buy it. This is the reason why I think you shouldn't buy it. Bitcoin is the leader of all coins. It's not making new highs. That's a signal to me that we're near the end of the rally, you know, at least for the next few years in crypto, right? Because what happens is the first big coins, they top out. And then what happens? Money starts to flow into the other coins, all mm-hmm. coins, right? You know, Ethereum probably topped out um, as well, 4,200, 4,300. And now you have Dogecoin or Dogecoin. You know, I told him, like, my belief is that, you know, you had some major events. You had Coinbase went public, people buying into that. You have, you know, other events like Elon going on TV. If that means people are buying into him going on TV, because they think it's going to go to a dollar. Well, who is going to buy after? If everyone already bought it before he goes on TV, who is going to come and buy after for you to sell it to? Yeah. Oh, I didn't think and you have like that. such a good way of, like you are such a natural teacher because the way that you just explained that, I feel like anyone, even if they just started trading yesterday, can understand the lesson that you are giving. I mean, it's incredible your ability to explain things so that everyone can understand them. Well, I learned that working with the FBI, believe it or not. <laughs> so, and the, <laughs> I and the way I, the, the, reason I had a, the reason I had to learn that is because they're like, guy, you, you talk too sophisticated. You have to dumb it down because when we explain it to the SEC, they're not going to understand anything because they're really a bunch of idiots there. <laughs> literally that's what the fbi told me so i had to learn how to dumb things down for the idiots at the sec well we're honored to have uh, to be your student and learn from you um you uh, start talking about crypto i remember you uh, in 2017 when uh, bitcoin had uh, its top around 20k you called the exact top you talked about it on 
Bloomberg, and uh, we're very excited to continue hearing what you think about the short term and the long term of crypto. I don't know if we have time now or in the chat room or another episode, but well, you at, are the at, man. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, at that time, that literally was the top of crypto. I had the same analysis that I do now, which was we just had a major event happen, which was Bitcoin was added into the futures market, everyone was buying into it being added and who are they going to sell it to after it's added, right? Because you have this catalyst of people buying into the news, right? And then the news happened that it was no other buyer. So it just, it just collapsed. But that back then, Bitcoin was different because it was mainly just retail. What's happened now, why we've had another run in crypto specifically Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, and some of these other ones, but mainly Bitcoin and Ethereum is that institutional investors came into it after the pandemic as a safe haven because it was just easier to buy than gold. Yeah. And it actually appreciated more value than gold, right? Um, so you have mass, you know, big institutions that came in with billions of dollars, including Elon Musk, right? Mm -hmm. um, that came in to buy Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin is out of all of the coins is the best one to own long-term. And the reason why I believe that, like if it pulls back to 30,000, I'm gonna buy a lot of Bitcoin. The reason why I like it better than all of the other coins is not, it's for the reason that the supply of Bitcoin has a, has a cap of 21 million. There's no other coin that exists that has a cap of 21 million. And I also believe that, I mean, right now there's only 18 million that exist, but I also believe that millions of them are lost to never be found because if you've lost your password, right? And we've heard a lot of stories of that actually on the news about yeah. people not being able to access it. Exactly. You lose your password. That's it. You've lost it forever. So how many Bitcoins are lost? I think 25% yeah. of all Bitcoins have been You're lost. You're so right. So that, Which uh, means that the supply... Is is so low, right? Mm -hmm. And what did I teach you about stocks? When there's a low float, don't short it. <laughs> because yeah, you, only it's, guy it's, shorts it's, it though. <laughs> you, we don't, <laughs> we're not allowed, but you sure do. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, when, when it pops, you know, 300% in seconds and then you know that there's a squeeze happening, then it's a different story. You, there's, there's a high probability of a, a massive pullback. Yeah. But with Bitcoin, like, I believe what Elon did, okay, Elon purposely caused Bitcoin to go down with his tweet because other people need to buy more and they needed to buy it at a discount. Mm -hmm. No one wants to pay full price, especially big money. Exactly. Who knows what they paid him to tweet that? Someone paid him off, I think. You know, I have another, you know how he likes to manipulate stuff and he probably knows a lot of market makers as well. Uh, I, I, I really saw it on the technical level. I mean, he, like, he, he could have cool. tweeted it so that he could buy it himself cheaper. That's well, did you see it? Aria called this? She called it in the chat room. I couldn't stop saying it to people because I could see, I, I did crypto for a whole year, day trading it in 2017, day and night. Well, just so just remember when well. Elon, when Elon tweeted the stock price is too high. Yeah, that was what totally- What did the stock price do? Crap. The stock price basically quadrupled yeah. from the time he said that. I knew immediately right? he was trying to trap shorts. He would never do something, you know, you, you play your, like, uh, it's easy to read Elon, I think. But um, I think what happened, maybe, because like, how could I have known like two days before? I, I couldn't stop telling people, please sell. And I, I got to get that sense of crypto whales, like when I was uh, trading so much in the past, uh, it's not regulated. So it's not too hard to sort of pick up on that. And I, the market was crashing guy and um and crypto wasn't moving on a critical level on ice thin levels i it, it, i knew something was up i knew they're holding the price just so to do a rug pull and then you know maybe he had an insight of what was happening that's just another theory speculation uh, 
what I feel happened. And mm -hmm. so he just pulled out knowing that what was happening, I think. Yeah. It's anything's possible, right? And we anything's are- Anything's possible, but the reality is long-term, it is the coin that will probably be worth a million dollars a coin in like 10 years or 15 years from now. <laughs> I know it sounds like so much, but it's the truth mm -hmm. that there's coins being lost constantly. There's a limited supply of it. And it's the first, it's the mm -hmm. first coin. Ethereum, for example, they create 18 million new coins every year. It will never reach the price of Bitcoin. It might reach the market cap of Bitcoin, but only because they're print, they're adding more coins. So it doesn't mean you'll make money, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, no. Dogecoin, Dogecoin is a little different because there is only the supply that they have. It's a huge, massive supply of it. Mm -hmm. But you know, we'll we'll see what happens with that. I <laughs> I, I, don't, no I don't one I don't know. But you that knows about all of these details and the small picture, the big picture the vision of a stock or crypto. Well, like I feel, I feel like the, the big move happened, right? The big move, like I, I, I bought some Ethereum around 500. I got out at 3,300, right? I missed an extra thousand point move in a, just a week, but I caught a big piece of the move from 500 to 3,300. And I call it out in the room. I'm like, I'm going long Ethereum. I don't know if you remember it, but mm -hmm. it was probably in the, in the original room a, a while ago, right? And the big move is over and you know, that's, that's it. Like there'll probably be a, a stabilization or a correction in the market. To me, the signal to get out was what I told you is that Bitcoin was not making new highs anymore, even though the altcoins were, that's exactly what happened in 2017. Bitcoin topped out, all the altcoins started running and then, you know, the move was over. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel the next thing that's going to happen, by the way, like there's a cycle of things. You had the stock market made this huge move. Now we had this pullback. Some money's going to come out of the market, right? There's people that made a lot of freaking money that stayed invested. Uh, people made a ton of money in crypto, right? What, what needs to make the next move? It's real estate. Real estate is going to be the next We're seeing it. mover. We're seeing exactly. it. There's the, the yeah. supply and demand. There's a complete disconnect. Prices mm -hmm. are ballooning. And there's only so like, especially in states where they don't, they cannot zone any more land to build on. We are seeing, yep. we're seeing it happen. I think you're absolutely right. Again. <laughs> well, what do you think is going to happen after? Do you think there's going to be some kind of a bubble formed and, you know, with real in, estate? After? In real estate? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, on real estate, it really, it really depends. We don't necessarily have to see a bubble form. Bubbles form when there's extended credit. I think banks have learned their lesson from 2008 Let's on extended so. credit, right? So I don't think that we're going to have that issue. I think what the driver of real estate prices is two things. One is limited supply, um, interest rate risk of interest rates going higher and people rushing to buy before that happens. Mm -hmm. and massive wealth that's been generated from the government printing so much money will be the big driver of real estate. Um, it's not going to be from what, what happened in 2008. It's like, Hey, you don't have any money. Here's a house. Right. Yeah. You that's make minimum wage. Here's five houses. The ninja loan, no income, no job approved. Right. <laughs> so that's, that's what caused the collapse. We don't have that type, type we don't of situation. Have that time, there was like, they, that, back then we had time? speculative we had speculative buying of real estate you had people going to florida and developers building 300 homes and you had most of them owned by investors on credit right so that's what caused that so i, I don't see that happening thank yeah. you Will you come back with us again so that we can finish this incredible interview with you? Because we have so many more questions that we didn't even get a chance to get to yet. And I would love for us to ask you more if you don't mind. Sure, I don't mind. I don't mind, I don't mind you at all. So thank you. We're not going to take that. Yeah, you. we're holding you to it. No um, problem. Have a, have been, a great weekend. 
You well. too. And we've been putting, um, I've been putting your, the, the link to the discord in our YouTube videos and uh, Aria and I give you shout outs all the time. We love you so much. We are your biggest fans. We will never stop annoying you. And uh, we'll have lots of questions for you next time. And anytime you want to come on, you are welcome on. You are the honorary leader of the Trader Babes now. You are the biggest babe. For sure. Thank you so That's much. That's where we met Erica and I. So yes. we'll always have a special place. Always. In our hearts. Yeah. In our hearts. And, mm -hmm. and also, you know, as a trader for me, uh, guys uh, who made me my maker. <laughs> oh my God. It, it changed my life completely. My life has never been the same since the day I met. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. We'll have you back again soon. So we can finish asking you these amazing questions. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful weekend. You too. Thank you. Bye. 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 Want more Trader Babes? Subscribe now and connect with us on social media for exclusive content and access you won't find anywhere else. And we'll see you right here on the next unforgettable episode of Trader Babes.